Haven, Haven. Hey. How was your appointment? Was it okay? Sorry, what? Uh, you said you had an appointment yesterday, right? Would it go okay? Uh, well, my eye appointment? Yeah, yeah, one time. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Hi. Hey. Oh, hey, Jesse's here. Yep. Hi, Jesse. Let's maybe wait like a minute or so for other people to show up. <clears throat> oh, can't make it he's the main person from last time so maybe maybe we can just start um <clears throat> well maybe i'll wait like one more minute i'll just wait until 10 5. yeah we don't have any strict upper bound today right not super strict but you know i do have to eat lunch and things uh so um all right maybe i'll just recall some setup uh, and also, this is something that I kind of got a little flustered towards the end of the discussion last time and, and sort of said, but didn't actually, wasn't actually sort of super precise about. So maybe let me make this a little more precise and then recall where we were. Um, so let's suppose. Uh, I have a sequence of K by K self adjoint matrices, and their law converges to the law of some tuple in some tracial one I'm in algebra. Again, what this means is that. So that tuple should also be self adjoint. So for every um, polynomial, non q polynomial in our variables, one over k trace of this tuple converges to the trace of P of A. So that's what that means. Um, <clears throat> then I'm going to define theta A. So A here is standing for this tuple, the sequence, rather. Um, so that's going to go from the von Neumann algebra generated by A to this ultra product. Some ultra filter. Um, and it's just the unique map which sends polynomial in A to the corresponding polynomial in this tuple. Okay, so I sort of verbally said this last time, but wasn't super uh, precise about it. So, um, so there's, like I said, we're at this two-step process of um, what I called tensor HT. So this is now this theorem of Bolinsky and Kapiton. Uh, so tensor HT implying Peterson Tom. Um, and that two-step process is one, um, if tensor HT holds, not, sorry, not, it's actually, step one is not using tensor HT. So uh, 
uh, if um, Q subset of N is diffuse, M here is throughout just going to be the von Neumann algebra generated by a free semicircular family. Uh, and so let's just say given. So if Q is diffuse and has one about an entropy non positive, well, it's zero in this case because I know this thing embeds in R omega. I know M embeds in R omega, so they'll, it's, it's always non negative. So if it's zero, then for almost every choice of pairs, of sequences, I have theta x restricted to q is unitarily equivalent to, is unitarily conjugate to theta y restricted to q. Um, so there's a few comments I should make here. Uh, by Wojcicki's asymptotic freeness theorem, theta x is defined for almost every x. Uh, here also, I should say that when I say almost every, I'm equipping. Um, this uh, space with the infinite product measure um, and nu k is, is, the, is the distribution of GUE. Right, so there's some implicit measure when I talk about the Gaussian unitary ensemble uh, that's what this measure is. I take its R full power. That's what it means to take independent copies. And then I take an infinite power of that. Okay. And of course, when I'm taking about talking about the, the square here, when I'm talking about the second fold power of this infinite product, I'm equipping that with, you know, this tensor itself. So, so this does not imply amenability, right? Because you're looking at embeddings of, of the over of the super thing. Yes, so uh, notice that uh, when I said step one, I didn't use tensor HT. That's where tensor HT comes in. Right, right. Uh, and step two is that if, and this can be stated without any reference to random matrices. Um, so if I have A, K, uh, B, K uh, sequences of N by N matrices, uh, and if they're laws, let me say it like this way. Uh, if the law of AK tensor identity on K by K matrices, identity on K by K matrices tensor BK op converges to the law of A tensor one, one tensor A op. So A here is assumed to be in some, some other algebra N, self adjoint R tuple. Uh, and this convergence is is a, is a strong convergence. Okay, so before we had weak star convergence, this would be strong convergence. So strong meaning for all polynomials, the norm converges to the norm of applied to. Yeah, strong meaning what I said last time. So the the convergence in law, so convergence weak star. Yeah. Okay, and convergence of norms of polynomials. Yes. Now I didn't go through this last time, but you can read off the norm of a polynomial from the law. You just sort of apply the spectral theorem, right? Sure. Um, yeah. So it's just the soup of the L2K norms, and you can write down what the L2K norm means in terms of the law. But convergence of the norms does not necessarily imply weak star convergence. No, that's why it's the conjunction. It's the yeah. conjunction of both of them. It's weak star plus convergence of norms. Convergence of norms is typically much harder. Uh, and in this case, convergence in, of, of weak star convergence for what we're looking at just follows from weak star convergence in each variable separately. Yeah. As we discussed last time, that doesn't hold for strong convergence because AK cannot equal BK if N is non-amenable. So um, I'm not done with this statement yet. So if this holds for this, uh, and if the C star algebra generated by A is locally reflexive, so I'll explain what that means in a bit, but it's some basically it's some approximation property that's satisfied for anything that's exact. So for the C-star algebra generated by R free semicirculars, it's true. Uh, then for all Q less than equal to N, uh, 
non-amenable uh, theta a restricted to q is not unitarily equivalent to theta b restricted to q. Okay. So the point here is tensor HT implies uh, almost every XY satisfy the hypotheses of two. Okay. And I'm oh, sorry, well, yeah. Wait, isn't it literally every XY? Almost every. Um, but in the assumptions of two, you just say that A, K, and B, K are microstates for. So, not if. Yeah, it should be given. Ah, right. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make it clear? Yeah, yeah, okay. So for this specific choice of microstates, if, if I have this tensor strong convergence under the assumptions that C star of A is locally reflexive, then these embeddings are not unitarily equivalent when restricted to any non-immutable subalgebra. Mm -hmm. okay. So the point is, is that tensor HT implies that almost every axe in Y satisfy that, you know, our, our pair of A and B as in two. And so these embeddings are not unitarily conjugate when restricted to any non-amenable uh, subalgebra. Mm -hmm. And one kicks in and says that, well, if the, if the one bounded entropy is zero, then also for almost every choice, they are unitarily equivalent when restricted to the subalgebra. Um, and you know the intersection of measures of one sets is measure one, so uh, this forces Q to be amenable. Okay. Very nice. Great. So let me start uh, just because it's the one that doesn't require any usage of the one bounded entropy. Or this, in retrospect, I should have just started with presenting this and then gotten into one bounded entropy later. Uh, and that could have saved me some time. So may, maybe that's what I'll do in, in future discussions around this. Uh, but maybe let me just start by addressing two. So yeah, the annoying thing about these virtual talks is that I can't keep things like on a chalkboard. So try to keep try to keep this statement in your mind. Um, maybe one thing that will help is recalling the definition of local reflexivity. Uh, wait, so this Belinsky uh, Capitan result says that for a measure one set of microstates, you have condition two happen. Yes, yes. Okay. That, that's, ex that's literally what the, what, the, what the statement holds. Now, actually, I can get away with weaker in, in, in this. Um, like in one, what I can really just say is that instead of happening almost everywhere, it happens in probability, which, which means that like there's a sequence of subsets of MKs of C self adjoint to the R, which have measure tending to one, um, so that whenever I take sequences that, you know, whenever I take a, 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 a an infinite list, some 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 K, some sequence of K of R of R tuples, and each of them lie in these subsets, then blah 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 blah. So I'm saying almost everywhere to simplify the statement, but you can get away with like with high the, the corresponding thing happening with high probability. So in probability, somebody says something happens with high probability to say that it occurs on a sequence which has measure tending to one. And these sequences can be measurable subsets in different probability spaces, that's fine. And so you can really get away with, instead of almost everywhere, with high probability. Um, and so then you would just need to, to do two, you just needed to prove that this tensor HT holds with high probability. But anyway, because of concentration of measure and things like this, uh, once it happens with high probability, it actually happens almost everywhere. And well, people understand almost everywhere better. So let's just say that. Okay, great. Uh, other questions? So for proving primeness of, of LFF2, um, well, I guess it's already, it already follows. Uh, All right. Okay, never mind, never mind. That's, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Or, All right. or primeness for any subfactor. Uh, so you, you have to go through all of this. Um, um, yeah, no for primeness for any non immutable subfactor, you have to go through all of this. Uh, I don't, maybe there's another proof using deformation rigidity. Uh, Rolando and Jesse would know better than I, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm saying using this, using this approach, there's no shortcut for, for that alone. Also, this gives you strong solidity of every non amenable. Uh, so, well, no, I yeah. guess that follows from strong solidity anyway. Never mind. Um, yeah. That follows, yeah. So, okay. 
then then you get primeness for every non-immutable thing just from so, strong solidity anyway. But um, yeah. Um, okay. I, as discussed last time, this gets you a, a massive generalization of strong solidity anyway, where instead of taking the normalizer, you can take the von Neumann algebra generated by the singular subspace. Yeah. It yeah. contains all these other weak normalizers. It's you can think, I like to think of it as like the largest weak normalizer, the largest weird normalizer. Okay. So look, we're, any other questions? Okay. Again, feel free to hop in with questions. It's supposed to be sort of informal. Um, so A is a C star algebra. Um, you say A is locally reflexive if um, whenever I take a finite dimensional operator system. So again, remember what this means is this is a, a vector subspace. Those are adjoints. Um, there is a net. Um, so actually, it should be finite dimensional subspace of the double dual. Uh, a net so that phi alpha of x uh, converges to x. Um, For all x and e, uh, and this convergence is in SOT. Uh, so some people might state this in terms of WOT, right? But by a convexity argument, that's that's equivalent to, to what I said. Um, this bidual thing is kind of wacky, right? It's this like massive object. So maybe let me say this more concretely. If I take a faithful representation of A, uh, and if E is a subset of uh, the generated von Neumann algebra, which is a finite dimensional operator system, uh, then there is I guess I can just take a sequence anyway, because it's finite dimensional. Yeah. Uh, then there is a sequence um, so that uh, pi composed of phi n converges to the identity on E point S of T. Okay. So that's really how we're going to use it. Just Instead of the by dual, just look at any specific generated von Neumann algebra. All right. So let's prove two. Okay, so let me scroll up and remind you of the statement. Okay. I have a question about locally reflexive. Yeah. Um, so, what are some examples? Of locally reflexive oh, things. Sorry, yeah, I was very bad and broke broke the Vaughn rule. Um, uh, anything exact. Um, <laughs> Wait, so, go, can you go up a little bit uh, for a statement two, uh, uh, like this, the second part of the theorem? So you need. Uh, oh, right, you need the whole thing to be locally reflexive, but that's that's like kind of avoid the assumption because f2 is already yeah. locally reflexive okay. so anything exact so exact what i'm saying is that exact implies to look reflexive this is a oh i'm bad i forgot who to say proof this but uh somebody very important and I i'm forgetting their name and this is recorded and now i'm in trouble um exact implies locally reflexive wait but um that's not i think, I think that follows from from like brown and ozawa it's in Brown and Ozawa. It is not a theorem due to Brown and Ozawa, but it is in their book. Um, um, it's weakly exact stuff. It's not there, I think. I think it's in this 
part where they talk about C versus C prime or something. Um, I think it's theorem 14.2.4. Okay, do they say? Or at least I think it follows from that. Okay, do they say who it's due to? Uh, no, if you look at 14.2.4, one implies two, right? I think two is exactly what you, you, you have. Yeah. No, it's, it's it's an earlier section about C and C prime and C double right. prime. It's it's a theorem of Kirchberg. Thank you. Uh, it's the Kirchberg that I forgot. Uh, it's a theorem of Kirchberg. Um, so, uh, so free products of exact things are exact. Right. Theorem 9.3.1. Right. Uh, I believe this is due to Dykema. Um, again, I might be screwing that up. Uh, apologies to anyone who sees this if I screw that up. Uh, yeah, that's uh, correct. It's Dykema's thing. Okay, great. So pre free products of exact things are exact. So uh, in particular, uh, the C star algebra generated by free semicirculars is exact. Um, there's one other thing I should address in statement two before I get to the proof. Uh, really to say that this implies um, this uh, tensor HT thing, there's all these ops here and I should address the ops, right? And op is not, I mean, a priori that causes an issue because in the statement of tensor HT, there's no op. Okay, for matrices looking at the opposite algebra, you can pull that back, you know, you can make that isomorphic to the original algebra by just taking a transpose, right? So instead of op here, I really could have just said transpose. In fact, let's do that, okay? The other thing is if I take a free semicircular tuple and I look at their the tuple given by their opposites, so their tuple given in the opposite Seaster algebra with the same trace, right? That's also a free semicircular family, right? You just think about what it means to be free. Uh, and you just think about the freeness condition. It's, it, you know, taking the op is not going to change the individual distribution. So you just have to check that when you take ops that this remains free. And so that's also isomorphic. So, so this passing through transposes and ops is important for the proof of two, but is not important for the statement of, um, for, for affecting how you apply tensor HD. Also taking transpose preserves the measure. So again, that doesn't prove, you know, destroy any randomness things. The GUE is preserved and are taking transposes. Okay. Not a big deal, but something I should have mentioned. Uh, okay. So uh, Capitan, uh, uh... Belinsky's proof is only when you assume A is a, a free semicircular distribution. Yeah, so they don't even know yet if it's unitary. We don't even know yet for the unitary. Oh. Okay. Uh, so let's do the proof of two. So again, let me, there's been some discussion. Let me scroll back up. I scrolled up a few times, but again, just to really make sure everyone's on the right page. Okay. Um, so for two, again, uh, um, so, uh, oh, crap. Shouldn't be subset of A, it should be subset of the von Neumann algebra generated by A. All of this. Yeah. Okay. In our case, A is assumed to generate the whole thing anyway, so okay. Um, So the first thing we're going to do is when we're going to define um, uh, a representation uh, here. So I'll set M to be this script M to be this ultra product of matrices, just to simplify notation. And I have this representation uh, given by uh, left and right acting. Okay, so reasonably natural thing. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, great. Uh, so the point here is that to say theta A restricted to Q is unitarily equivalent to theta B restricted to Q. That's equivalent. I actually only need the easy direction of this, of this equivalence, but that's equivalent to saying 
that there is a Q central vector in L2 of M. Um, well, at the very least, it implies it. Uh, it's equivalent when Q is like a factor or rel trivial relative common or something. I believe it's equivalent in general, but it implies this. Okay. Because saying that, you know, U theta A of X, U star is uh, theta B of X, that means that when I look at, um, say, when I look at theta A of U star, uh, that's u star theta b of x, and okay, that means central. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, if you know this sort of Hagerup uh, con criterion for non amenability, uh, it's all about these sort of combinatorial, these sort of analogs of Laplacians and averaging operators, right? So, I want to sort of say that the norm of some averaging operator is less than equal to one. That's how I'm going to use strong convergence. So strong convergence. Is the other direction also true in this thing? I think so. Uh, so you can you can take the the polar decomposition, right? Uh, and then the polar part is actually unitary. So it's it's true like up to taking corners or something. Um, yeah, you can boost it to be a unitary. I think so. uh, at least so. Yeah. In our case, it's going to be true when Q is a factor because we already kind of have this trivial relative commutant thing anyway. So, but okay, let me just, I only need, the, let me just only state the direction that I need, which is the easy direction. Yeah. Just to make sure I'm not lying. Um, so strong convergence implies that for every X in the uh, algebraic tensor product of the C star algebra generated by A and uh, a op, um, the norm of pi of x is at most the min norm of x, mm -hmm. right? Because, well, first it implies that it's true for polynomials uh, and these things, and then you just approximate a norm, okay? So I want to claim that this remains true for all x in the um, von Neumann algebra generated by A, algebraic tensor product, the von Neumann algebra generated by A. Oh. Okay. And now I can't just get at norm convergence, right? And there are various ways you could convince yourself that this would work, like by trying to do Komplanski density or something, but it, it never actually works out without, and this is where local reflexivity comes into the game. Okay. So, so, uh, so let's fix some X here. Oh crap, I, I dropped the ball several times on this. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, I forgot to say something about these phi ends. They should be uh, contractive, completely positive. Yeah, otherwise I'm not actually saying anything. So I can write X as the sum uh, AI tensor BI op. And I can take E to be uh, the span AI union AI star union BI op union BI uh, op star. Okay. And that's a finite dimensional operator system, right? Because this is a finite. Okay. Uh, so by local reflexivity, um, there are these uh, phi ends going from the going from E rather, not the entire von Neumann algebra, to A, which are contractive, completely positive. Uh, I guess I can throw in one to make it an actual operator system and just say unital completely positive. 
um, in phi and x converges, oh, x is a bad choice, phi and um, y converges to y point SOT for all y in E. So um, first of all, when I look at phi n tensor phi n op and I apply it to x, um, so this is less than or equal to uh, the norm of x, okay? Right, because they're because the tensor product is unital and completely positive, so it's 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 in particular contractive. Okay, so that's the whole point, right, of complete positivity and complete boundedness and whatever is to make sure that things don't go badly when you start tensoring. You have to start tensoring here, so that's why you need it. Okay. Um, so I should actually say this in two senses. Two senses. Um, Well, actually, that's not what I I don't want the max. Um, I want the min. Why is this thing not erasing? It, uh, I'm slightly lost. Can you go up a little bit? I am can't. Thing is not responding, um, and I don't know why. Um, just give me a second here. Mm -hmm. um. So, what do you want me to go up to? Uh, yeah. So the question is, why do you need this uh, this claim? Um, so again, I'm trying to say that there are no Q central vectors if Q is non amenable. Ah, oh, right, right, right. And we use this Hagra characterization of non amenability, this con Hagra characterization of non amenability. So that's a statement about norms of certain elements. Right, right, right. Okay. And it's not, now it's not. <sighs> it's like a terrible thing about virtual talks, they never work. Um, First of all, this is true for the men. Um, the other thing that's really important here is when I look at pi of phi n tensor phi n op applied to x, it's less than or equal to this. Uh, in the min norm, because we already, because because the point is these things now are in A tensor A op. So A here is the C star algebra generated by A, by, by, by A. Okay. Right, and we already checked that on the C star algebra generated by A uh, that we have this second estimate. Right. So that that was that was this statement here. So maybe let me start. Okay. And you can check that the fact that phi n of y converges to y point S O T. Well, that implies in particular that phi n of y minus y in the two norm goes to zero. Uh, and this implies that uh, um, pi of 
phi n tends to phi n op. Uh, I get my parentheses right. Applied to x acting on some, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, C say converges to um, pi of x acting on C for every C in um, in script M in this ultra power. Right, so maybe let me expand on this. Right, I can lift C to some sequence, which is bounded uh, norms. C is a bad choice. Uh, and it's also a bad choice. Uh, D say, which is finite. Um, and so when I look at pi of phi n tensor phi n op x applied to C, uh, that gets, uh, you know, what I'm doing is, oh, come on. Good God, I don't know why it's so hard for this thing to decide to erase. That is the sum of phi n uh, a, uh, what did I call my x's? AI, yeah, AI, C, phi n b, uh, and just sort of, you know, checking this term by term in the two norm, this converges to the sum of A, C, B, uh, and that uses that C is L infinity. Okay. So it's true for all C and M, but just because it has a uniformly bounded norm, it's true for everything uh, in L2, so. SOT. Um, <clears throat> this is just because I have a uniform bound on the norms of these things. I had to make a lot of uh, corrections there, but is everybody with me? So then the pi, pi of x is, well, you know, the norm is semi-continuous in this point SOT, in this SOT topology. It's just SOT. So the norm is semi-continuous in SOT. Uh, and each of these I already said had norm bounded by the min norm of x. Um, by these two bullet points, right? So that's using that the phi n is contractive and completely positive. Great. Questions? Great. So now we will use this to say that theta a, as to say that yeah, theta a restricted to q is not unitarily equivalent to theta b restricted to q for all Q inside of the von Neumann algebra generated by A, non immutable. Now, if Q is non immutable, this implies this is uh, basically Kahn and Hagrup sort of independently um, that there is a projection in the center of Q. And uh, u1 through u s uh, unitaries in qz, so that when I look at the sum of one over s, the sum from j equals one to s of u j tensor u j bar, that's less than one. So the u j bar here is the opposite of the adjoint. So uh, I'm going to call this x. It's going to be my x. Uh, and so by 
by the above, pi of x is less than one because this norm here is the minimum. Okay. So let's suppose uh, psi in L2 of M is Q central. Um, actually, I, I don't want to do that. I actually do want to take a unitary. Yeah. Let's suppose I have some unitary V ultra power. So the theta u uh, x, u is u theta uh, b x. I guess not x, I want uh, y for all y is q. Uh, and so what's gonna happen here is if I apply x to u, We'll get one over s sum from j equals one to s. Uh, theta a of u j. This would be a v. I'm sorry, everybody. If my thing, my tablet will let me erase. So v theta b of u j r. Right, uj bar is uj star op, and so the op acts by acting on the right. Um, and so now, by assumption, I can move this over. And use this as a homomorphism. And say that I'm getting v times Theta B of this projection, the central projection Z. Okay. And so the norm of pi of XU, the two norm of that is just the two norm. So this is just theta B of Z. This is just V theta B of Z. Right. I'm averaging a constant thing. So this is just the norm of theta B of Z, which is the square root of the trace of Z. Okay. Is everybody with me? So on the other hand, um, pi of x u is less than or equal to the norm of pi of x. Well, uh, this uses these, I'm really sorry. Oh my God, I realized another mistake I made. So um, really what I want is when you apply this to V times theta B of Z. So let me redo this. This thing will let me erase. I can redo this computation. Hell is going on. Right. So so that still ends up being theta B of Z. If I take the two norm of this, well, that's less than or equal to pi of x two norm of this. Uh, but I said that the norm of pi of x is less than one. And so this is a contradiction. I proved that a number is less than itself. Um, once I correct this. I have to tap what am I doing? Why am I cramming this? So that's a contradiction. Um, so this is actually pretty similar. Uh, and it's actually sort of inspired by um, an argument in Keyfond Sinclair. Um, 
if you if you look at how they prove that that some algebra is non amenable they do it exactly by this sort of thing by a sort of looking at norms of uh, and and they use local re reflexivity actually in, in a very similar way. Okay, so this is actually where you're starting to actually see some parallels not necessarily I mean parallels not precise connections not theorems that we can prove that if you can do this in free probability you can do this in deformation rigidity but parallels in the techniques. Wait, Ben, uh, I kind of got lost in, towards the end, but can you explain to me where exactly you're using the tensor um, uh, HT? I haven't used it yet. Um, I'm using the conclusion, I guess, but I haven't, I haven't done anything with random matrices. No, no, but like, uh, where do you use tensor HT inside this, this theorem? I mean, where do you use the, the fact that tensor HT works inside this theorem? Uh, here. Uh, star. Ah, uh, I see. Um, yeah, can you explain this implication? Sure. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to give a non-virtual version of this because uh, nobody can follow virtual talks. Uh, okay. So why? Uh, so given uh, some, again, some C uh, in M, and let's say some X in uh, uh, some P, which is a point, which is a tensor product. Um, so I can write P is some P J tensor Q J. So finite sum. Um, if I look at P uh, applied to a uh, tensor one, one tensor a op, um, really pi of this applied to C. Thing is killing me. Um, applied to C. Finally, um, this is in, in two norm. This is the limit as k goes to omega of the sum from j equals one to k of p j of this a k applied to c k applied to q j of um, b k. Right, right. Each of, individually, each of these is less than or equal to the limit as k goes to omega. Mm -hmm. I guess here I'm, I'm sort of implicitly using that matrix algebras are nuclear. Yes. Um, I guess it's a transpose. And this is strong convergence. Says that this is equal to the min norm of of a and a 
op times the two norm of C. And then you just approximate. Okay. So I can do it for polynomials, and this is a norm continuous thing. Because I'm saying okay. the statement. Okay. Uh, any other questions about the proof? Um. Right, so the way you, you, you say that they're not conjugate is you use this Hagrup, that uses a con Hagrup thing to say that like, you know, there's some sort of combinatorial, something like a combinatorial Laplacian, which detects that they're, you know, it's the same thing that occurs with non-amenability in groups, right? To say that a group is non-amenable means that there's a generating set so that when you average over that generating set, it has norm less than one. Okay, so yeah, my, my question is, so if you just look at step two, what you end up getting is that you get that this theta sub uh, x is not conjugate to theta sub y. Yes. Uh, for for, huh? for anything non-amenable. For anything non-amenable. Yes. But like, can't you use like regular version of uh, Jung's theorem to like no. get the answer? No. This was the question I asked yesterday. No. But Ab absolutely, absolutely not. Uh, one hundred percent not. Um, for like, for like, uh, one is. Jung's theorem will produce a specific embedding uh, so that when you restrict, they're not conjugate. And this specific embedding will be a measure zero phenomenon. It, it, will, it will certainly, the, the random matrix model will assign this specific choice of microstates zero measure. Um, like even if you start with a random microstate for Q. Right, because it's amplifying by like a fixed sequence of. It has this block structure. Anything with some sort of block structure is a measure zero phenomenon from a random matrix thing. So, uh, if it were that simple, Peterson, the Peterson Tom property would hold for every non immutable von Neumann algebra, which it certainly does. No, no, no. But like you need the step two, right? To get that, uh, to, to get that, if you have a free semicircular distribution, you can actually get this. Yes, but step two doesn't use anything about random matrices. It just says, assume, you know, let me scroll back up. To yeah, yeah, step two plus the step two plus uh, Capitan. Right, uh, why, which is why you need, that's what I'm saying. That's why you need Belinsky Capitan. That's why you can't just get it from Zhang. If you could just get it from Zhang, two would be true for everything. And then the peterson tom property would hold for everything. No, 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 no. Okay, so here, here's my question. Maybe I'm not saying it correctly, but just look at step two plus Belinsky Capitan. Yes. My question is, can you use that and then conclude instead of going through step one? No. So like the, the question is really how tight is the usage of like one bounded entropy here? Because that's that's the part I don't really. Um, um, let me say that the usage of one bounded entropy here, step one um, is not that difficult. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, that, it's that not, I believe. Yeah. It's really not something that you should be worried about. Um, I assure you, it's not a problem. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've read it, but the, I, I guess I'm just asking how tight is it? Like, you, you, do you really need to use it? Like, um, yes. So, uh, yeah, I guess I should rephrase what I said earlier. Um, I mean, if you want this, if you want the, the join of non amenable things, sorry, the join of amenable things to amen, be amenable if they have diffuse intersection, the only thing you know in advance is that they have one bounded entropy zero. So I guess the question is, does the randomized Jung theorem imply that the one bounded entropy is zero? No, no, because, because the one bounded entropy could be detecting some microstates that have nothing to do with this specific model that you chose, right? Right, I chose a very, very specific probabilistic model, right? And it could be that there are many other microstates that this model is assigning measure zero to. It could occur, it could be that there's some, you know, positive fractional dimension amount of microstates that are occurring in some, well, fractional dimensional subspace, which a uh, Lebesgue measure is going to assign that measure zero. Mm. Right. So, yeah, you, you can't really, I mean, 
So you can't make, you can't find a characterization of uh, inclusions with one bound entropy, uh, with entropy in the presence zero in terms of uh, restricting embeddings of, of the larger one, uh, in terms of like some random conjugation result about uh, embeddings of the larger one. I mean, I probably can. It's just that you will know no information about the, it will say that there exists a sequence of probability distributions such that blah, 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 blah. Uh, you will gain zero information about what the probability distributions are. Um, like I, I can, I'm surely I can characterize one about an entropy in terms of like some, you know, take a sequence of probability distributions which are asymptotically supported on the microstate space uh, and write down some entropy, entropy like quantity associated to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I can absolutely write down a formula that will characterize one about an entropy. You will just gain zero information about what the microstate, what the probability distributions are. They're going to be sort of like limits of dense, you know, finite, almost dense subsets of the microstates, a uniform measure on them, you know, uniform measure on a finite, almost dense subset of the microstate space. And you will know nothing about that. Um, so, okay, so, okay, I, I, I get what you're saying, but let me ask one final question. So let us say, let, let's consider this property that for every, for almost every uh, embedding yeah. of, uh, sorry, for, 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 so look at the pairs of embeddings, put a measure on that space, and then consider, uh, say that there's a measure one subset, so yeah. that like the pairs of embeddings of, of M uh, are conjugate when restricted to Q. Not conjugate, or are, oh, sorry, are conjugate. Are conjugate. So does this imply that H of Q in the presence of N is zero? No, take your measure to be a Dirac mass. Uh, okay, but put the measure, put the, the, the infinite product measure on, on the matrix. The product uh, of what? Um, just the, um, so you put the, the standard measure on the, okay, so, so now, I guess. Now you're just specifically talking about free semicirculars again, right? If, if you right, take right, right. the GRE, then you're only talking about semicirculars, right? If you want to talk about another algebra, you need a different probability distribution that models that algebra. So in, in F2, this is true, right? Inside L of F2. Inside L of FR, yes. Yeah, inside L of FR, like H of N in the presence of, uh, of L of FR is zero, if and only if this condition holds. If and only if Q is amenable. Yeah, if and only if Q is amenable, and then if and only if, if any uh, pairs of embeddings. Okay, so that's, okay, yeah. so, you cannot go like without without passing through this result. You cannot get the other implication. Um, so so two is very general. Two two like I said is not about random matrices. It does tell you that the strong convergence of tensors is very strong. Uh, it's a very strong condition. I guess yeah yeah okay okay because it tells like this also re-explains why you can't take a equals b. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This conclusion will never like. Theta A restricted to something is going to be unitarily equivalent to theta A restricted to the same thing. Um, I can write right, right. which does that. Um, okay, so can you explain step one now, or is it? Uh, yeah. Still time? Uh, do you mind if I take like like five minutes or so? Not five. I mean, you can take as much time as you want. It's yeah, only been one. I just need. To, I just want to get some water, and I want to like see okay, okay, thing to calm down because it is like being a little uh, annoying. Um, Maybe you can restart the, the iPad. No, I don't think that'll be necessary. I think it just needs to like, I need to like get a fan pointing out this thing or something. I think it's overheating. Um, so I'll just stop the share uh, for a bit. Um, but yeah, everybody take take five or so, go to the bathroom or something. Um, like I don't want to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. We'll wait. <laughs> Wow. 
Ben, are you there? Uh, are you going to water? Oh, yeah, you're going to water. Recording is back. Uh, I have. Are you gonna Are you gonna post this recording on on a public domain? I might. Um, uh, I one thing I'm thinking is uh, we still. I I think Braga still has access to the like UVA Operator Theory YouTube page because uh, I think if I just keep the link, I think it eventually expires. So you probably have to download it edit it and then I might try to post it there. Uh, I think just Zoom eventually the link expires, right? Okay. Let's talk about Zoom. That's cool. I need to get a new tablet. It's really annoying, but like, let's do this. There we go. Um, so let's talk about two. So uh, I stated it above, but let me, or this is not two, this is one. We just did two. Um, so the statement is if H of Q in the presence of M is zero, then for almost every, uh, pair x y uh, theta x restricted to q is unitarily conjugate to theta y restricted to q. Um, so this is something where um, a second it gets so it gets a little technical. Um, so let me where did I put this? Yeah, it gets a little technical. Let me sort of sketch the main points. I want to start with the following thing, um, which is concentration of measurement. So I'm going to let X uh, rho mu be a pseudometric measure space. Okay, so. That means rho is a pseudometric on X. Okay, so uh, do people want me to explain pseudometric? It, it's just a metric, but points might have distance zero and be not equal. That's it. Satisfy the triangle quality, it's symmetric. And mu is some. Um, So it's a non-Hausdorff topology. Yeah, in my case, it's there's an underlying metric that rho is continuous with respect to. Um, let me say let me say it like this. Um, X here is in fact going to be some compact Hausdorff space. Um, I would prefer not to think about non Hausdorff spaces. So let's just say that this is a continuous pseudometric, meaning it's continuous as a function of two variables, X is compact Hausdorff, and mu is a Borel probability measure. On X. Okay. So you can try to think about X quotiented by rho or something like that, but mu is not going to necessarily descend to that. I mean, you can push it forward, but. So for epsilon positive, I let alpha be mu of epsilon rho, I guess. This is the uh, soup of the measures of the epsilon neighborhoods of sets. Um, take the complement of that. So that the measure at least is at least a half. Okay. So you're probably sitting here like, what is this? Um, the point here is that if the measure is at least a half, then the measure of its epsilon thickening is at least one minus this alpha rho mu epsilon. That's the only thing. 
<clears throat> so the point is just that um, this control, if, if this decays, so you should think of this as associated to, to some sequence of spaces, very quickly it will be. Um, and if th this decays quickly, it means that like whenever I take any sets which asymptotically have non-trivial size, then uh, if I blow them up, just like if I take a small neighborhood of them, they blow up to basically everything. Um, so like on a sphere with like this round metric, um, this alpha d mu epsilon uh, decays like e to the minus constant depending on epsilon k. Right, so this is this picture where if I take uh, like a small, if I take a, you can, there's this isoparametric thing where this is sort of, if I look at a measure, a set of measure at least a half, and I look at its, it's the measure of the complement of its epsilon thickening, the, the, the maximal, the worst possible case is like right around the center of the sphere. And if I take some sort of epsilon band here, you can check that this has measure, which is tending to one exponentially fast. Right, because this is essentially just writing down a ratio of two integrals. Uh, and, and more and more of the mass is going to be concentrated near where this function is not decaying exponentially. So uh, another definition. So given uh, a sequence x k rho k mu k of pseudo metric measure spaces, um, and a sequence uh, of positive numbers tending to infinity, we say that x, k, rho, k, u, k exhibits exponential concentration of measure at rate at scale r, k, if gravity epsilon positive, alpha rho k mu k of epsilon, um, any, any more space. Sorry. So the first thing I'm going to do is take one over k log of this. Uh, and so I want this to decay. So I want this to be going to something negative and I want this to occur like at, at all scales. So I'll take the negative of this. So it becomes something positive. I'll take the room soup as k goes to infinity. And I'll say that that's a positive number. Okay. So the point here is that if I take some sequence of sets, which I've measured at least a half, uh, then their measure of their uh, uh, for every epsilon positive, the measure of their epsilon thickenings this doesn't really I guess it does say this. I guess I have to subtract a little bit so let's subtract some little of one term. Um, we'll have that. Okay, so in probability theory, uh, this exponential rate of decay is called a scale. And the scalar that you multiply pi so that this inequality is true is called a rate. Um, I didn't make those rules, uh, but that's how it goes. Um, Hey Ben, so are there any sort of special um, scales that are important? Like let's say if RK grows geometrically, is that, is that special in some way or? 
Um, so geometrically is like asking for quite a lot, um, but is yes. It, is, it, is it usually linear or over? Um... Let, I'll say very, so in our case, I want it to be RK to be K squared. Uh, for the sphere, for, for sort of most spaces, you expect it to grow <laughs> dimension. So this, this scale should be sort of uh, rate related to the dimension. Okay, gotcha. So yeah. So the GUE exhibits exponential concentration of measure uh, of scale K squared. So when I think of this as a random tuple, actually the entire, you know, the whole R tuple. exhibits exponential concentration of measure of scale R K squared. And that very much has to do with the fact that self adjoint matrices are a vector space of dimension K squared. Um, this is a relatively classical fact. Uh, I don't want to sort of, it, there, there are references in the paper about who you can see that it's, it, it follows from. I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds on that. The important thing here is like, you can prove it via like a log Sobolev inequality uh, there are sort of curvature estimates that get it to you. Um, there's lots of ways now to see this. So, I mean, it's not, it's, it's frequently used in, in random matrix theory anyway. So it's not surprising that it's used. It's maybe surprising how it's used. So the concentration is happening on the diagonal or? Um, yeah, I don't know if it's the same. I don't know if you have a nice isoparametric thing like you do. This, this fact that for spheres it happens the, the worst possible case is on is is near the center is some sort of isoparametric statement. Um, I don't think that's true here. It's just concent it, concentration is concentration. Uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, with scale r squared, I should specify with a metric that's with respect to this orbital metric. Uh, so the orbital distance in the imp over unitaries u a u star minus b. So it might be scale r squared minus one because or minus k squared because I've sort of modded out by the unitary distance, but uh, that's not a big deal. Uh, so let me explain something about here. Uh, oh, sorry, other questions? Um, so the important lemma is this, let's suppose x rho mu is a pseudometric. Measure space, and uh, the me I have a set whose measure is bigger than this concentration function. Again, you should imagine that I have some sequence, and this concentration function is is getting very small. Then, when I look at the two epsilon thickening of a set, that has measure at least one minus the concentration function at epsilon. So the point here is this. I define the concentration function by looking at measures of sets which had measure at least a half, right? And looked at measures of their epsilon neighborhood, right? If instead of half, I want to take any other number, well, again, if this, if this is a sequence of quantities that are decaying, I don't need this measure to be bigger than or equal to half. I basically just need that it is eventually, um, it's not decaying exponentially decaying slower than an exponential. So I can even take some sets which are decaying uh, in measure, but as long as they don't, their measures don't decay too quickly, then I can look at their two epsilon neighborhood and that's still gonna basically swallow up everything. So the proof of this is, is not hard, but it's kind of fun. Um, it's enough to show that the measure of the epsilon thickening is at least a half. 
because if the epsilon thickening has measured at least half, then by definition of the concentration function, the epsilon thickening of that is going to have measure at least one minus uh, uh, this concentration functioning, but the, but the epsilon thickening of the epsilon thickening is contained in the two epsilon thickening. So, okay. By the triangle equality. Uh, if this measure is less than a half, well, then the measure of its complement is bigger than a half, right? So the epsilon thickening of the complement of the epsilon thickening, okay, as measure at least one minus this concentration function, okay? And so then the epsilon neighborhood of the complement of the epsilon neighborhood has to intersect um, the original set. Okay. Their intersection has positive measure because mu of E is assumed to have measure bigger than the concentration function at epsilon. And they are so that, that this set, this is measure is one minus this. This is measure uh, bigger than this. So they intersect, right? They have a positive measure intersection in particular, it's not empty. Uh, but if you think about that, that for a bit, that's a contradiction, right? I can't have something which is in E and epsilon close to something which is in the complement of the epsilon neighborhood, right? So a point in the intersection would have to be epsilon close, would have to be in E and have to be distance less than epsilon from something which by definition is distance larger than epsilon from E. So that can't happen. Great. Uh, so the goal here is to show that uh, exponential concentration measure of scale A squared implies uh, microstates collapse. which is uh, what I'm referring to as item one. So this statement that almost every pair of microstates are unitarily conjugate when you restrict, that's microstates collapse. I'm saying that if I choose random choices of microstates, they all collapse under one unitary conjugation. Okay. Uh, so the precise details are a little technical because you have to deal with, um, you have to deal with, um, you know, the one round in entropy and everything. So let me give the rough sketch. Uh, and then if people want, I can, I can go through all the brutal details. So what's the rough sketch? Um, diffuse and uh, as one button entropy zero. So, uh, And without loss of generality, I can take Q to be fine. Um, this thing about being unitarily equivalent when I restrict, right? I'm doing this in an ultra power, so it behaves well with respect to sort of inductive limits. So I can just write Q as an increasing closure of an increasing union of finitely generated things, check it on each finitely generated thing, and just apply sort of countable saturation or whatever you want to call it. Okay. So let's say Q is the von Neumann algebra given by Y. Remember M is this von Neumann algebra given by S. Um, so I can apply uh, David's uh, non-commutative functional calculus. So I don't actually need to do this, but it does simplify things drastically. To write Y as some function of S. So this function is some generalized function. I'm not really saying what it is, but the important thing is that F is uh, L2 uniformly continuous. Um, and it's defined on uh, elements which satisfy some bounds uh, over every trace of one on algebra. Okay. So 
So it's some sort of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really a collection of maps indexed by all tracial one RNA algebras. Okay, and it's uniformly continuous in a sense that um, for all epsilon positive, there is some delta positive, so that if X and Y have two norm distance less than, than delta, if they're bounded and operated norm by R on, and they're in some von Neumann algebra, which I'm not specifying, but it's just holds uniformly over all von Neumann algebras. It's like L2 equicontinuity. And F of X minus F of Y and two norm is less than epsilon. Um, and what you do is you argue that uh, for almost every, uh, X, Y, um, so what do you argue is this? So we reverse things. Uh, for every epsilon positive, and for almost every X, Y, uh, the orbital distance between uh, F of X, K and F of Y, K, uh, the soup of that is less than epsilon. So in the ultra product, when I look at this theta uh, x of f of uh, s, it's going to be given by this tuple f applied to my approximates. Okay. Uh, and so if I argue that this is true for almost for, for every epsilon, then these things will actually be unitarily equivalent in the ultra power. Right, because saying this orbital distance is less than epsilon is saying that there's some sequence of unitaries so that when I conjugate f of x k by this unitary, it's epsilon close to f of y. Right, and if I can do that for every epsilon, I can just run a diagonal argument to say that they're unitarily conjugate in the ultra power. Okay. So now the idea for this is, well, I use h k h q of m equals zero to, uh, densely pack uh, my microstate space uh, in, in the presence by uh, sub-exponentially many balls. Okay, um, I can't quite do that, but I, I can do sub exponential in the sense that like I can make it decay exponentially, but that exponential rate of decay can be as slow as I want, provided it's still exponential. And that's literally what it means for the one bounded entropy to be zero, is that I can do that. Okay, um, so sub exponential balls in this orbital distance. Okay. So one of them, or really, this produces a sequence. I have sub exponential many balls, and they're covering everything, right? And this GUE will converges in law, right? So, so those, those one of the microstate spaces having measure, which is essentially one, right? And so when I have these sub exponentially many balls, okay, I need some bound. But if I have, when I have these sub exponentially many balls. Um, for something that has measure essentially one, one of these balls has to have um, measure which is not decaying exponentially. This produces a sequence. So it's going to be some 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 delta. All of it. Uh, I'll just say it doesn't decay exponentially. Again, that's not quite true, but it's you can modify it slightly. But then this lemma says, okay, I have exponential concentration of measure. This measure of the set, it's not decaying exponentially, right? So it's grow it's it's eventually larger than the concentration function because the concentration function is decaying exponentially 
right? And so that means that eventually it's, it's you know, uh, two delta thickening. So the delta here corresponds to this epsilon. So this implies that mu k of n to the 22 delta, it's probably like eight or something. I don't really know. Um, is at least one minus uh, some constant depending on delta k squared. Okay. And well, that does it. I guess I should really do this. I just apply this continuous function. Right, I now have this one unitary conjugation orbit, which is taking up almost all the size. Right, uh, and so by Borel Cantelli, uh, you know, the set of things which are eventually in this unitary conjugation orbit, or right, the set of things so that f of it is, 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 I guess I should really say f inverse. Yeah, I, I did this incorrectly. So this is applying uh, uniform continuity. The things which are which are, which are eventually in this inverse image by Borel Cantelli has measure one, uh, and so almost everything is eventually unitarily conjugate to this one fixed thing. Okay. Uh, now, if you want, okay, I should maybe stop at I don't know twelve thirty or something so that I have enough time for lunch. Uh, if you want, I can actually go through the bloody details of that, uh, but it might be hard to pay attention to virtually, but this is, this is the core point. So, I mean, I, I leave No, I think that, that part I'm, uh, I'm, I'm okay with. That part you're okay with? So you understand just this yeah. Thing, sketch? Yeah, yeah, I understand. I'm happy. Okay, great. So this is the same, I should say, this is the same as in uh, H, Jekyll, Nelson Sinclair. And it's really a general principle. It's really just this general principle that so in, in the in the paper with David, Brent, and Thomas, um, the microstates collapses in terms of relative microstates. And so you're actually dealing with honest metrics. And so it's a little bit easier to do, uh, but not much easier. It's 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 about the same same order of difficulty. Um, and it's just a general principle that if, if you have exponential conservation of measure. Um, then this thing, uh, th then all the microstates have to collapse, you know, relative to this measure. The measure has to concentrate on a, on a single microstate, either in the orbital sense or in this relative sense. Um, the importance here of the decay of K squared uh, is that K squared is how you define the one bounded entropy, right? You take one over K squared log of blah, 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 right? If I wanted to do uh, some other uh, exponential concentration of measure with respect to a different sequence of scales, I would need to modify the one bounded entropy to be defined. You know, I'd have to take some modified one bounded entropy, which is defined by uh, by that. So um, let me say something about here. Um, importance of k squared is that this one bounded entropy was defined by saying that took uh, over epsilon over neighborhoods from super k goes to infinity one of the k squared log k epsilon orbit gamma k r uh, y b the two norm, and okay, that's a lot to unpack, but uh, the important thing here is that these are the same number. So that's why k squared, it's because it's those k squared. Because when I say that this thing has one bounded entropy zero, and that means that I can sub exponentially pack, it means that, like, well, really, you know, I have to fix the, the, the rate corresponding to delta, I have to choose a fine enough neighborhood so that. Uh, for this epsilon, this this 
this, this quantity before I take the soup over epsilon. Um, I guess it would be soup over delta, really, but um, you know, I know it is soup over epsilon. The soup over epsilon is is you know decaying fat, you know, slower than that exponential decay. Um, and so then that's why I can pack with sub exponentially many balls because, well, this is a packing number, right? This k epsilon is a packing number. So that's how I'm packing with sub exponentially many balls. And it's just like, I mean, you write out what that means. Uh, one thing that helps uh, one thing that helps here is if I take this non commutative function f so that f of s is y and I push forward my uh, new k and so r so new k here is, is the GUE uh, then this also has exponential concentration of measure of scale k squared. So because of this L2, you know, so I should mention a few things about this functional calculus because it's really nice. It's natural, it commutes with homomorphism. So in particular, it commutes with unitary conjugation. So the L2 uniform continuity says that once you start with measures that have exponential concentration of measure of scale k, k squared, they're push forwards do because all that amounts to is sort of replacing your concentration function for epsilon with some concentration function for delta, where delta corresponds to epsilon as in the uniform continuity statement. Okay, so instead of working with 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 your original sequence of measures, you could work with this sequence of measures, uh, and then this is really concentrated on the microstate space for y in the presence. Uh, and so you can kind of get away with, with not thinking about the function so much and just sort of thinking about the statement about sub exponentially, you know, packed with sub exponentially many balls, et cetera. Uh, and yeah, that's in the paper. There's a few technicalities here, like, you know, the GUE is not supported on an operating norm ball, right? It's, it's a Gaussian, so it's fully supported. Uh, but most, you know, the thing, there, there's a fixed operating norm ball so that going outside this operating norm ball decays exponentially. And so you can just sort of rescale, you can just sort of restrict to this ball and rescale. There's little tricks you have to do like that. None of them are that complicated. Uh, but this, this sketch is really the full, the full uh, idea. So. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. And also another question is, um, in this paper of uh, uh, Belinsky and Capitan, like how, like how, what's what's the what, I mean, like what's the size of the proof of the theorem? Because it's sixty-seven pages, but like you know, where in the paper I'm supposed to read uh, to find the proof? Uh, I haven't looked myself, so I don't really know. Um, I mean, I don't want to read seventy pages <laughs> uh, yeah. if if they're not going to be like. Like I, I, like you know, I want the shortest possible route to the to the proof. Uh, yes. Yeah. So maybe let me stop the recording now. Yeah. Um. Oh, okay. Um, so maybe in, in 20 minutes or so, I'll, I'll explain uh, uh, what little I do know about proving strong homogeneous. Mm -hmm. um, so the first trick, uh, and this really goes all the way back to Hagar and Thor Bjornsson, Oh yeah, one second. Before you do that, I had another question before you get into the details of this. Um, so in step two, right? So what, what, what you show is that if you have a pair of embeddings that satisfy tensor HT, then um, the, the embeddings are not conjugate. When restricted to any non-amenable subalgebra, and, and this, that the C star algebra generated by the generators is locally reflexive. Yeah, 
uh, one second. And then in the first step, you show that for any uh, subalgebra with one bound and entropy zero, you always have that measure one subset of the embeddings when they're to zero are all conjugate. Yeah. So the, the measure one subset does depend upon well, for the restriction. So for, for part one, the measure one subset does depend upon the subalgebra. Um, but the, for the second part, the measure one subset doesn't because the, the subalgebra isn't really referenced in the, in the second step. The second step, the hypotheses are just about strong conversions. Um, so this is a bit of a subtle point you have to think about because there are uncountably many subalgebras. Uh, but the measure one subset you get does depend upon the subalgebra in step one. Yeah. And, and I think this proof of step uh, two is, uh, you know, it's very similar to, like I said, the key and Sinclair. Right? It's, it's using weak amenability to sort of push these uh, averaging operators that show up from non amenability into some C star algebra where you know how to work with things, right? It's exactly what Keepon and Sinclair do. Um, okay, sorry, I, I'm being a little annoying, but coming back to my earlier question, right? So I'm, I'm having a little trouble understanding, so like, a, like, a minor, like may, maybe a minor point, but uh, for Peters and Tom, right? So for Peters and Tom, what exactly do you need after knowing? Uh, tensor HD plus step two. All right, so. Tensor HT plus step two is by every non amenable subalgebra H of Q in the presence of M is positive. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, that, is, that is with step one. That is with step one also. So tensor HT plus step two does not imply this. It implies that for, for almost every pair of embeddings, Uh, yeah, okay, but that, like, that doesn't buy you much. Yeah, that's what I'm not, that's what I want to understand, why it doesn't buy you much. Um, Here, here's a probability measure for which that's true, the Dirac mass. So this is an important point. Uh, a sequence of Dirac masses satisfy exponential concentration of measure with any, any sequence of scales you want. Okay, This is like a stupid comment, but that kind of not stupid comment, because what it tells you is that exponential concentration of measure by itself doesn't do anything. It has to be used, it, exponential concentration of measure is a very powerful tool, but it has to be used in conjunctions with some kind of homogeneity of your measure. Some sort of way in which your measure is still kind of like, it's concentrated, but also spread out, right? It's like with property T and amenability. It's like with clashing rigidity and some deformation, right? It's the same sort of thing. You need this contrast. You need exponential concentration of measure to say that the measure is largely concentrated somewhere, but you also need some kind of homogeneity to say that things are spread out. Now, in the paper with, with uh, David, Brent, and Thomas, this homogeneity that's being spread out is this external averaging property, which is saying that you can sort of simulate the conditional expectation by averaging over the relative microstate space. Okay. Here, the homogeneity statement is the strong convergence. That, that is some kind of homogeneity because it says it's not a Dirac mass. As I said, the canonical counterexample for strong convergence behaving well in our tensor products is like take two equal matrices, right? Take two equal sequences. So that's already what step one tells you. Step one tells you that this is giving you some sort of homogene homogeneity because it's saying that like, when I restrict these things to non-amenable subalgebras, they're not conjugate. So the, these 
things have to be a little spread out from each other. Yeah. So by itself, exponential concentration measure won't do anything for you. You're just using that. Your theorem applies to the rack masses and is therefore tricky. Um, And how do you get from Peterson Tom to uh, sorry from from this from this theorem to Peterson Tom? Great. So give us a name. So I'll call it the Pinsker property. Probably a bad name, but essentially what it's saying is that. I've classified the Pinsker algebras. They're all the amenable ones. They're all the maximum amenable ones. Great. Um, let's suppose Pinsker property. If uh, Q1, Q2 are amenable and they have the Hughes intersection. Um, and the one by the entropy of their join is less than or equal to the sum of these because they have the fused intersection. Oh, I guess, okay, okay. I guess uh, I'm, I, I, the statement of Peterson Tom that I want is. Uh, Right, right, right. But then Q1 join Q2 is amenable. Yeah. Okay. I guess it's fine. It's cool. It's cool. Because the statement of Peterson Tom that I was looking at this, like every every massa is is contained inside a unique uh, maximally amenable subalgebra. Sure. Like this. Right, so we'll then, but then it's equivalent to this. I can see that. Okay. So. But I can just give, give you proof in that language if you, you prefer. Well, so let's suppose. Q less than the M is diffusion amenable. Okay. Uh, then the one about identity of Q in the presence of M is zero. Right. Uh, and so there exists a unique uh, uh, intermediate subalgebra. So the P is maximal with respect to having one better than entropy. P zero in the presence of that. Yeah, but why is that unique? It's the same argument as above. Uh, uh, right, 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 because you can take the join. Be diffused, their join would have one about an entropy right. zero by maximality and have to be equal to Nice, both. very nice, very nice. Uh, so there is such a unique, and such a thing must be amenable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need diffuse though. And it's maximal amenable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very nice, very nice. Okay, sounds good. So it's kind of almost, e it's like basically equivalent. I, I don't know, maybe it's not equivalent, but I yeah, don't it's think. It's saying that, that all maximal amenable subalgebras are pinsker. Right, right. So yeah, all maximally amenable subalgebras are pinsker. Okay, very nice. All right. So let me, in the remaining few minutes, say what little I do know about strong conversions. So step one is due to high reference of Bjornsson. Um, I'll try to use more neutral letters. Wait, 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 sorry, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, Like, I mean, do you have to, I mean, like how, how strict is your upper bound today? Like in like 10 minutes or? I mean, I have to meet Rolando at two. I have to make lunch. I gotta be done by like 1230 or something. Okay. I have one more question, which is that like, if you like, just take Peterson Tong. Hmm. Uh, so, so your theorem and, and Belinsky, whatever that implies Peterson Tong, that's clear. Yeah. But like the other direction is like definitely not true, right? No, the other direction is not true. Peterson Tom says nothing about random matrices. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in this case, uh, it, in the case of F2, it's it's true because it's proven already. But like, 
but like in general, it's not true, right? That if you have Peterson Tom property in any one, I mean, also says, says nothing about like. I mean, it's expected. It's it's expected that this Peterson Tom property holds for like one, I mean, algebras of hyperbolic ICC groups. Yeah. So there, there's probably some property T group for which the Peterson Tom property holds, and you're gonna have a hell of a time because of our work with David, producing nice random matrix models. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, okay, cool, cool. Okay, I guess you can continue. Uh, so to say that this uh, converges strongly in law to some other thing. Uh, it's enough to show. So this is this linearization trick. That whenever I take um, Some n by n matrices. Uh, well, first of all, it's enough to show. Uh, well, so let me see this. Let's show this. Then, when I take a linear polynomial with matrix entries, but I also get. More on convergence and, and both sides here are the min tensor products. Okay. Uh, and that these things converge in law. Um, did tree drop or? I guess I'm answering his question that he's no longer here for. <laughs> so. Uh, I can stop here. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe should I wait? I'll text them. Problem solved. Sorry, you got cut. My bad. No, it's fine. Uh, it happens. Um, so this is this linearization trick. To say that you have strong convergence, it's enough to show this strong convergence for linear polynomials with matrix entries and weak star convergence. Now, weak star convergence in our context, we already have, right? That's just what Gillespie is asking product Um And step two, which is where most of the work does, is you consider uh, so the same MN of, as above, MN of C valued um, um, Cauchy transforms. So specifically, you're looking at the conditional expectation on the MN of C of this uh, expression. Okay, for, for, I think actually you want to take, you might even want to take a matrix here. So, yeah, I, at this stage, it's probably best to just look it up because uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get this correct. Uh, whether you're supposed to take just really Z, subtract out Z times the identity or take a matrix, I think you actually want to take a matrix, but you want this sort of matrix to live in the upper half plane. In some sense. So you want it to have positive real part. Is there positive minus part? Yeah, I think that's what I want. Um, I might have had it correct before, I don't know. Uh, and basically what you want to say is you want to say that this is close uh, to the norm of this 
it might actually be being close in norm again at this stage we're now getting into the part where it's probably best to triple check everything i'm saying by looking at the relevant papers uh, of the same sort of expression in the infinitary level Uh, and once you argue that, it's it's actually sort of standard by now from Hagrup Thorpe Bjornsson to say that this implies convergence of the relevant norms. So, so it is using von Neumann algebra's tool and that it's using this conditional expectation. Um, the Belinsky Capitan proof seems to use a lot of like non commutative derivatives. Um, other proofs of things in this direction have used some, has used sort of freeness in some way. Um, you, you do use a bit of operator algebra to actually prove this, in particular to prove this linearization trick. Uh, this linearization trick, you can look at the proof in Hagrup Thor Bjornsson. It's it's a statement about, you know, you have some CV map on a, you have some some CV map on a on on something, and it satisfies some norm condition on some generators, or on some linear polynomials, and that it has to be a homomorphism. Things like that. So, um, PZA actually wrote a really nice paper around these sort of things. It, it was, I forget the name, but something like PZA linearization trick. If you look on archive, you'll find it. Um, that explains this trick really well. Fantastic. Great. Okay. So, um, Right. So I guess I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to leave. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think this, uh, I think this concludes our discussion, right? At least for the, for at least for table. now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, but we should discuss further. Uh, let me, let me think, let, let me, let me take some time to think because I want to see what happens in a general case uh, for general free products. Uh, if we can, if we can do something or amalgamate of free products. Uh, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think you would have to get some kind of relative version of strong convergence. I mean, I could see, I could see sort of relative amenability showing up in some way. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I know I know a little bit about amalgamated free products. So let's see. Uh, let me let me think a little bit. The thing is that I the reason I'm I'm confident is that you have this. You can use a little bit of deformation rigidity actually because you can actually get that. You can you can locate the position of subalgebras very nicely inside amalgamated free products. And like when you have this bad location, I think you can the strong convergence kicks in um, because because you have a lot of freeness and you, maybe you can isolate like some some but like good. You're not going to be able to get strong convergence for the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, not for the whole thing, but yeah, when yeah, maybe some sort of restricted strong convergence. Um, I I don't know because uh, when you're inside one of the subalgebras, you can't say anything, right? Because it's uh, it, the subalgebra could literally be like not prime so or like prime or whatever. yeah so maybe what you want is like strong convergence when restricted to uh any well we're, yeah. so you I, you could probably formulate this using david's functional calculus yeah. but you could do you could try to do some kind of like strong convergence when sort of restricted to any um subalgebra which doesn't intertwine into one of the sides yeah. and then that would be enough yeah um and yeah that might be true um but i think that would require really different techniques yeah 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 no but this opens up a lot of a lot of things to discuss oh, about. for sure for sure so i mean actually that seems like not a bad idea um yeah it seems like not a bad idea i just don't know yeah let's talk further in in waterloo and stuff in the next yeah, few months yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we can we can have this this David was suggesting something about like an online mini course or something, right? We 
can try to do that yeah. but i mean when depending upon when that occurs i might be uh so i'll be um i'll be visiting my family like middle of july uh-huh so depending upon when that is i might not have internet access right 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 <laughs> when i visit my dad we might be going to well basically an environment where it's not that isolated but it's isolated enough that if you want to use the internet you have to drive somewhere ah uh, or you yeah, have, i forgot that your dad is like not growing no, my, my i'll just stop the recording now because i don't think